Uh, this evening so I used to saying this morning you know I was just having a thought just a couple of days ago like you know whether or not it'd be a good idea for us to meet um, Saturday mornings because I feel like you know when we meet on Saturday uh, Sunday nights you know I might exhort you to do something but then you know it's Sunday night you go back to work and you've forgotten what I preached about as opposed to maybe we met Saturday morning and I'm preaching on something like I'm preaching on tonight then that would encourage you to get involved in what we do on the weekends, which is, uh, which is soul winning. So I want you to think about last words. You know, if you think about when somebody's going to die or somebody's going to go away, generally they leave people with last words and those words, you know, are quite poignant or they're quite uh, important because that's what they want to be, that, that's what they want remembered uh, when they leave. And we see examples throughout the Bible of people saying their last words, whether it's on their deathbed or whether they're about to leave. You think about, um, you know, Moses leaving words for Joshua, Joshua leaving words for the, for the nation of Israel. Uh, you think of King David on his uh, deathbed, uh, leaving words for King Solomon to show himself a man and things like that. Or if we look into the New Testament, you know, there are many examples of people giving last words. You know, Jacob was another one. You know, Joseph giving last words to take his bones when the children of Israel would come out of Egypt. Uh, we even see last words in the New Testament where, you know, Paul in Acts 20 is um, departing to go back to Jerusalem and he's saying some last words to the, to the disciples. And you remember he's warning them about false prophets and false teachers that would come in and to beware of those people. Um, not only P in Peter, in the, in the epistles of Peter, you see those epistles are also written before Peter was about to die. And he's saying, before I put off this tabernacle, his body, he wanted to stir up the disciples to remember to, to serve the Lord and to, and to do certain things. Um, but let's think about the last words that Jesus uh, left us before he left this, this world. And it's no secret to us in this church, and I just wanted this to be a reminder tonight, that the last words of Jesus before he left the disciples was what? It was the Great Commission, wasn't it? So let's just have a look at those passages. And this, this Great Commission was actually mentioned uh, in, each of the, in each of the Gospels. Here's how it's said in uh, Mark 16. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the Gospel to every creature. Um, let's look at it in Acts. So... It's not mentioned in the Gospel of Luke because Luke actually wrote the book of Acts as well. I don't know if you know that, but he wrote uh, the book of Luke, which was a, a gospel account of Jesus and what he did. And then he wrote the Acts of the Apostles, which is, was a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. And we see here in Acts 1.8, uh, where he accounts here Jesus ascending. And when he's ascending, he says here, But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Uh, let's look at what is said in John in terms of the Great Commission. Then, <clears throat> then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And we'll just go to the last passage, which is the most famous in uh, Matthew 28, um, in verse 18, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So these are the last words of Jesus to his disciples. And if we think about the importance of last words, whether the people were going to die or whether they were going to go away, we ought to take heed to what those words are because that is what Jesus wanted to leave his disciples with. So we should think that these words are really important because this is what is left with the disciples when Jesus was leaving them. And you know, the Great Commission ought to be on the mission statement of every church that there is. 
right? There's three aspects to the Great Commission. One is to preach the gospel to every creature, which is what it says here in verse 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. We can see in Mark, what are we teaching them? We're teaching them about the gospel. We're teaching them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it follows that we would baptize those people that believe. And then the third point is that we teach people the word of God. We're teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And notice that the Great Commission is to teach, right? So it's not just that we, we preach the gospel, right? We get baptized and then we just learn whatsoever God has commanded us the rest of our lives. It's not, right? So you're, you are not actually fulfilling the Great Commission if all you do is preach the gospel, right? And you're baptized, but you don't teach anybody the Bible, right? Because part of that Great Commission is that we are teaching others what to observe all to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and you know obviously not everyone is qualified to teach in church and i you know ladies you know are meant to keep silent during church but that doesn't mean you can't teach other people the bible right you can teach other people you can see in timothy that the older women are to teach the younger women to love their husbands to love their wives to be discreet chase keepers at home so that's part of your great commission is it might not be to teach and preach a sermon in church but you're still to teach others to observe all the things that god has commanded us not just to you know we're only preaching the gospel and then leave it at that that's not the whole great commission so it ought to be the mission statement on, uh, on every church and even when i was putting the documentation together for our church you know you have to register with the acnc to register as a charity so you can be tax exempt so you know you, you got to do that right otherwise the government's going to take you know portion of the money so if you can do what you can so that the government doesn't take more of God's money than they can, um, you know, you, you have to abide by those rules. So even when I was putting it together, you know, they asked for the, you know, your, your purpose or your mission statement. And, you know, and that's what I put in there. I put that ours was to, you know, preach the gospel to everybody in, that, in, our, in our surrounding suburbs and to teach believers the word of God. So that was in our, our mission statement. But, you know, we need to be reminded of, of this mission statement today. Um, and in church today, because today in churches, and you've heard this before, but the Great Commission, what has it become? It's become the Great Omission, hasn't it? And what do we mean by that? Is the one thing, the, the statement that Jesus left churches with, which was to preach the gospel to every creature, to baptize them, and to teach the Bible, that's the one thing that a lot of churches are not doing these, these days. They're not preaching the gospel. You know, they're, they're, they're not always, they're not, a lot of them are not baptizing people correctly. You know, they're sprinkling them, baptizing babies, and therefore when they grow older, like in the Orthodox Church or the Catholic Church, they're not baptizing them, right? Because they think they're already baptized when they were baptized as an unbelieving child, and they're not teaching people uh, the Word of God. So not only is, has this become the great omission in many churches, but it's become the great omission in many individual Christians' lives where that they're not doing what Jesus has commanded them to do. They don't take part in the soul winning. They don't take part. They don't teach anybody the Bible. And, you know, hopefully they've at least been baptized. That's the easiest thing to do of, of, of the three things in the Great Commission. Um, so what do we see in churches these days? I mean, instead of soul winning, like a lot of churches don't, don't preach the gospel anymore. They don't have any outreach events, but they, they've turned more into a social club, haven't they? You know, where they just get together and they're just making friends um, and they think that that's, that's church. You know, and, and obviously that, that is an aspect of church, but that is not the goal. You know, the goal of our church, and, and I, that's why you guys need to, to, to get on board with what the work of this church is. What you're sitting in tonight, this is not the end goal. You know, if, if you're thinking, hey, you know, hey, great, we've got this group together, you know, we're like-minded believers, believers gathering together, making friends, and you think that's all this church is about, you, you've missed it, right? You've missed what this church is about. This is, what this church is about is about the Great Commission. Yes, you know, we're we come together, we're teaching people the Word of God, but remember, we've got a ministry that we are trying to get the gospel out there. We're in this neighborhood, we're in Punchbowl right now, and that's why we go soul winning. We're trying to fulfill this great commission. We're trying to keep the commandment of God our Father, and that's why we have the soul winning times every week. And if you're not involved in that, you've, you've missed the point of our church. Like, this is one of the, like, one of the major things. There's three things here. 
This is one of the major reasons why this church exists, is that we can preach the gospel to every creature. And if we don't do it, who else is doing it, right? Because it's become the great omission in a lot of other churches. How, if you were to ring around all the churches here, how many of them are going out into the highways and hedges and trying to preach the gospel to the neighborhood here? None of them are, right? Because they're trying to go doing the other methods, which is what I'm going to be talking a bit about later. So you see churches just become like these social clubs rather than a, 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 a springboard into getting people out there and trying to get the message out as far as we can into this neighborhood and into our surrounding suburbs. I already talked about, you know, churches, especially of, of the Protestant nature and the Catholic nature, or the Orthodox nature, where they are not baptizing believers because they are sprinkling or they are sprinkling babies and then they won't get baptized when they're older because they think that, that they've already been baptized when they haven't. Um, and even when you go along to the churches that are having a gathering, what do you learn there? You know, because remember the last part of the Great Commission is to teach them to observe all things whatsoever Jesus has commanded us. So that you ought to go to church and hear from the scripture, hear about the commandments that God has for us, learn the Bible. But a lot of churches now, you go there, it's more, uh, you know, like I said, it's a social club. And you go there just for a motivational talk, like a pat on the back, um, you know, to, to sort of get you, pick you up until, until you can last the next week, rather than coming and actually learning doctrine and trying to figure out the teachings in the Bible. So, you know, I'm not saying, you know, you know this is not the case for our church and, and um, you know, not to that extent. But in every church, the, the percentage of people that are involved in the work of the church are always very few. No matter what church you go to, even if uh, you know you guys may listen to Faithful Word online, listen to Stephen Anderson and Roger Jimenez, and those guys, and you know they're great speakers, they're doing great things. But even when you go to their churches, it's the same deal because you know people are not, you know, they don't take this to heart that God has commanded us. He has a will, and if we love Him, we'll keep His commandments to be involved in preaching the gospel. I remember when I was at Faithful Word. You know, when we were there, it was maybe about 60 people there. But still, the people that would be going soul winning week in, week out would only be about 10 of us. There'd be a core group, just like it's, it's like in this church. And it's a sad thing that even in churches that make such an emphasis on soul winning, and rightly so, right? It's rightly so that a church ought to emphasize soul winning because that's the last thing that Jesus left with his disciples. He's leaving them. And what's the great commission? Hey, go and preach the gospel to every creature, teach all nations. That's why uh, we emphasize it. Um, but unfortunately, it's not always emphasized in the life of individual believers. So soul winning, it's, it's not an optional ministry. That's what I want, want you guys to understand. It's, it's, it's a commandment. This is a command of God for us to be involved in preaching the gospel to every creature. It's not an optional ministry. Like some, a lot of churches have optional ministries, right? Like whether you want to get involved in the music or whether you want to get involved with, you know, you might like cooking meals for people and all these other things. Like these are optional things that churches do. But the Great Commission is not an optional thing. It was something that was commanded and it wasn't only commanded to the disciples at the time, because if you think about it, even in uh, Matthew 28 here, he says, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. So he's not particularly expecting these people to reach the uttermost part of the earth, right? Because it was a commission that was left to the disciples. And we see this as we read through the Acts and we read through the New Testament epistles. We see that this is something that they then committed unto faithful men, which then committed it unto other people. And, and it continues the work to get the word and preach the gospel. So it's not only the disciples at the time, because they were commanded to go unto the uttermost part of the earth. Let's go to Acts 2. Um, where do I have it here? Uh, let's go back to, let me just find it. I thought I had this in my notes, but um, the point I want to make here is uh, staying out with the eleven. Look at what Peter says here. 
Acts 2 verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, and shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. So when the early church was sent out at the day of Pentecost to preach the gospel, what I want to show you here is that soul winning is not only for men, right? So it wasn't only for the disciples at the time. It's for us as well. It's not only for men, it's for women as well. Because when the Spirit of God came upon the early church in Acts 2 and they went out and started preaching the gospel to every creature, the Spirit was poured out on both men and women, both on old men, old and young. You see? So, and the reason why I want to make this point is, is because a lot of women and a lot of, like, say, wives, right? Like, wives will have a husband that's really involved in church. And sometimes they, have, they get this idea that it's like, well, my husband does enough for both of us. Like my, husband, my husband's going soul winning. My husband's really involved in church. So I don't really have to do that much. But what I want to show you here is that soul winning is for everybody. Everybody should be involved. You can't, it's, like, it's like children. Children can't live off the, the, the spirituality of their parents. You know, let's say you children, you, know, you have parents that are really involved in church, really involved in soul winning. That doesn't negate your responsibility to keep the word of God. Right? and to obey God in this commandment of the Great Commission. It's not like your, your dad and mom are doing the Great Commission on your behalf. You, know, you have to keep the Great Commission as well. You are commanded as much as anybody to keep this Great Commission. So it's not just for the disciples at the time. It's not just for men. It's for women as well. And we see this throughout the Bible, Philippians 4. Let me show you here. <coughs> where Paul is writing to the Philippians, I beseech Yodius and beseech Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. So we see both men and women laboring in the gospel. Um, so it's not good enough to say, you know, my husband goes soul winning for our family. And this is the reason why, like, I make sure my wife goes soul winning, you know, because it's my responsibility to make sure my children go soul winning when they're older. And it's my responsibility to make sure my wife goes soul winning. So that's why I, I make sure that, you know, it's, 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 been, it's been a bit low with um, the amount of ladies going. But if there were more ladies going, there would be more opportunities for my wife to go soul winning. So that when there is a lady going, sometimes I don't go soul winning because otherwise my wife goes weeks and weeks and weeks without going soul winning. And, and that's not a good thing. You know, I want my wife to be involved in the Great Commission just as much as I am. So men, you need to make sure you know, that you encourage your wife, you, know, you encourage your children to take part in the soul winning um, and, and you know, don't, don't let them get away with not doing it. Right? Um, we need to make sure our family is keeping the Great Commission alongside with us. Um, let's look at some of Paul's teaching. So we see here that it's not just for the disciples at the time. It's not just for men. It's for women as well. Um, but I want to show you here why it's all for, for all, um, all believers. Uh, let's read here from uh, 2 Corinthians 5. Um, and we'll just read... Uh, from here, we'll read from verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. And look at this. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. So you see how Paul is including himself with the Corinthian church saying, hey, to us, it has been committed this ministry to reconcile people to God, which is the ministry of preaching the gospel. To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Um, now then, uh, I, won't, I won't read the rest. So you see here that Paul is teaching that we are given a ministry in order to reconcile people to God. It's not just for the disciples at the time. It was continued in the book of Acts. And Paul is saying here that we have this ministry of reconciliation that we are to continue working at. Now, even if somebody was to say, well, Paul's not including the Corinthian church. He's just talking about the apostles, that they were given the word of reconciliation. But look here. 
Let's go to 1 Corinthians 4, verse 16 and 17. And we can turn to a lot of these types of verses where even if you say, hey, you know, that was Paul's job. Paul was a preacher of the gospel. He was committed the word of reconciliation. He was committed the ministry of reconciliation. But look at how many times Paul exhorts us to follow him and to do what he did. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So not only in this passage is Paul saying, hey, I'm beseeching you, I'm begging you to be followers of me and to do as I did, but I'm also sending Timotheus to go and teach the things that I did as I do in every church. So we're teaching in every church how we ought to live and what we ought to do. And we know that you know, Paul was sent to preach the gospel. Um, let's look at some other passages. First Thessalonians 1. Six. Oh, is that going to take me there? Thessalonians 1, verse 6. It says here, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Archaia. So here's Paul saying, Hey, you Thessalonians, you were following me, what I was doing, and that's great because then you then became an example for other people. So you see how like, it's not just limited to the apostles. It's not just limited to those of us who are in charge at church. Like, it's our job to go out and preach the gospel. No, it's everybody's job to get involved in the Great Commission. And part of the reason why, uh, well, one of the benefits of having leadership in church and one of the uh, benefits of having people to teach you the Bible is that our work would be even more fruitful than it would otherwise be if we were left to our own devices. Um, let's look at some others. I just want to show you that this is all through uh, the epistles. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so you has us for an example. So you see there where Paul is saying, hey, be, follow what I do, but also look out for others that are following as I do because, you know, uh, they're doing a good thing, right? Because uh, you have us for an example, so you know the sort of people to look for, to follow. Uh, let's look at uh, Philippians 4.9, where Paul says, Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. So do you, you see how, like, does, does Paul, is Paul giving you the impression that there were things for Paul to do, but not for the church to do? No, because Paul is living a life and saying, hey, the things that you've heard me teach, that you've learned from me, that you've received from me, the things that you've heard me say, and the things that you've seen in me. So you're looking at my example. Those are the things that you should be doing. And the God of peace shall be with you as you do those things. Not that... Um, not that you need to do those things for God to be with you, right? Because God is always with you as a believer. But he's saying, as you do those things, God will be with you. It's an assurance. Um, let's go to one more. 1 Corinthians 11. And he says here, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered un them unto you. So again, an exhortation to follow Paul. And, and you know, remember what Jesus said. He said, follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. So that was what Jesus did as Paul is following Christ. He says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Because when the disciples followed Jesus, they became fishers of men. And Paul is following Christ and, and the people that follow Paul ought to become fishers of men as well. And so we call it soul winning in this church. You know, why do we call it soul winning? I'll just go there quickly. In Proverbs 11.30, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. This is why, you know, this is where the phrase was coined, right? Why it's called soul winning. We're winning souls to Christ. Um, and, you know, preaching the gospel goes by many names, right? Preaching the gospel, evangelism, outreach, witnessing, sharing your faith. But, you know, it's not so much important what you call it. What's important is that you do it. You, know, you can call it whatever you want. It doesn't matter what you call it, right? Call it pros proselytizing for all I care. Like, like uh, what was his name? Pen? And, uh, Pen? Was it Teller? Is Teller the quiet one? Yeah, or Pen. I think Pen is the one that talks. 
I think Penn was talking about people giving him a Bible and calling it proselytizing. Whatever, that's why I don't call it that. So um, it doesn't matter what you call it. What matters is that you do it. And hopefully now you understand why it's such an emphasis at this church. And, you know, if you're, if you're sick of me saying to you, hey, when are you going soul winning? When are you going to come soul winning? At least, you now, you know, at least now you understand why I'm always asking you about it. You know, and always saying like, hey, hopefully you can come soul winning us sometime. You know, hopefully next week you're coming soul winning. You know, when are you going to come soul winning with us next? You know, it's because it's an important thing in this church. It's an important work. It's commanded of God. You know, we want this church to bring a lot of glory to God. And what brings glory to God? That we bring forth much fruit as a church. So that's why it's important. And if, you know, if, if being asked to go soul winning and being asked to get involved in the work makes you uncomfortable at this church, good. Because we don't want you to be comfortable if you're not involved in the soul winning. Because this is, this is what's very important at our church. It's a, it's a, it's a big part of what we do. That's why if, if we had no other ministry... No other work to do at this church. There will always be soul winning because that is the Great Commission. We don't want the Great Commission to become the great omission in this church. Now, let me give you a bit of a rundown why we knock doors. You know, because there are many ways, there are many ways to preach the gospel, right? There are many, many, many uh, alternatives, you know, but let me explain to you why I believe door knocking is sort of effective. It's a... Uh, um, you know, why, well, I guess effective, you know, why, why, it's, why I believe it's the most effective and it's a necessary part of any church's soul winning program. Now, if you break down how you can get a message out, because if you think about door-to-door, -door, like soul winning, it's like marketing, right? In the sense that, you know, marketing is trying to get a message out and different companies market different ways because they're trying to get their, their brand out or whatever. They're trying to get that message out. So it's the same with soul winning, right? You know, there are different ways to get this message out and some are more effective than others. And let me explain to you why I think door knocking is always going to be there. I'm not against other methods of soul winning, but I think door knocking will always be an integral part of preaching the gospel. Now, if you were to break up these different methods of getting a, getting a message out, you can kind of firstly divide it into two different types, right? You can divide it into the passive ways that you get a message out, which is like you're not being proactive about it, or you've got proactive ways to get a message out. Now, there's really only one passive way to get a message out, and it's, it's, it's kind of an oxymoron that it's a passive way of getting a message out because if you're passive about it, you're not really trying to get the message out. But what I mean by passive is that you are not proactively trying to bring up that conversation with people and um, what it's generally known as is lifestyle evangelism. Lifestyle evangelism is when you are waiting for people to ask you about Jesus and then only you will open your mouth and explain it to them. So you do, not, you do not actually bring up the conversation with them. You don't proactively bring it up to them. You don't try and look for ways where you can work it into a conversation or opportunities to talk to them about it. You're just waiting for them to look at who knows what in your life, look at something, and then hopefully ask you about it. Now, here are a couple of problems with lifestyle evangelism. One is, is, is it only reaches people you know, right? Because people you don't know, you're not going out there to go find them or to go meet them. So obviously, lifestyle evangelism will only ever reach the people that you know or the people that you come across. Now, let me ask you, if the Great Commission is to preach the gospel to every creature, should we have a philosophy in evangelism where there's a limit to how many people we can reach. Shouldn't, we should be thinking not, well, I'm just going to reach this group of people. Our philosophy should always be, I'm going to reach as many people as I can in my life. Obviously, I'm not going to reach absolutely everybody in the whole world by myself. But if there's an upper limit to my soul winning philosophy, then there's something wrong because that, that philosophy does not jive with the Great Commission, which the Great Commission is to preach the gospel to as many people as possible. So if you have the philosophy of lifestyle evangelism, which is, well, I'm just going to reach only the people I come across and only if they ask me about it. First of all, we're not going into all the world. You know, that's a proactive commandment, isn't it? To go into all the world and preach the gospel. Um, but we're not doing it to everybody that we could. So we shouldn't have an upper limit 
in our evangelism philosophy. But lifestyle evangelism only reaches the people you know, only the people that you'll come across in your day-to-day -day life. Um, it's not the example or command that we see in Scripture. Right? Do we see the apostles in, the, in Acts? Are they doing lifestyle evangelism? No, they're sent out. They are actually proactively trying to get the message out. They're not just living their life. Like Paul's not just living his life as a tent maker and then waiting for people to ask him about Jesus. Right? He's, 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 he is actually actively trying to get the message out there. So the other thing with lifestyle evangelism is it only works if you actually have a visibly positive effect in your life. Right? Because... Think about it, right? Like you, you don't ask somebody about, oh, what are they doing in their life if their life is worse than yours, right? Like, because it's sort of a promotion. It's, it's more like the prosperity gospel where they're, you know, you're, you're healthy, you're wealthy, you're so happy all the time. And then people are going to ask you like, oh, why are you so healthy, happy, and wise? Is, is because, you know, and then you tell them about Jesus. But is that what Jesus promises you? Does Jesus promise you this happy, wealthy, healthy life? No. So as a Christian, your life might be worse. You know, you're, you're, you, they may look at your life and think, well, I don't want that life. So who's going to ask you about what makes your life good if, if your life is not as good as, them, as theirs? So it sort of requires some visibly positive effect on somebody's life for them to ask you about it, um, if, if, that, if that's the method. And also, it doesn't warn people about the danger who are unaware of the danger. Like, what if somebody's not even thinking about hell? They're not thinking about death. How does lifestyle evangelism help that person? They're never going to ask you about it if they're not even thinking about it themselves. I remember I was out soul winning once and somebody said to me, you know, because we we're out preaching the gospel, right? And, you know, obviously some people don't want to, to be bothered about this. But one thing he said to me was, you know what? He, he, he goes to me, you know, we live in the information age. If somebody wanted to find out about Jesus and find out about how to be saved, they could Google it. They could find out about it. But that's not the only reason why we're out there soul winning. We're not just out there to teach people about Jesus Christ. That's not the only thing. But one thing is we are to warn them as well. We're trying to bring it to their attention because I said to this guy, yeah, you're right. If somebody wanted to find out more about Jesus and find out more about the Bible, yeah, the internet's out there. They can find out whatever they want. But the question is, are they thinking about it in their day-to-day -day life? Because most people, and he admitted this, it's like, you know, if I didn't talk to this, if I didn't talk to you today, I'm like talking to him. Like, if I didn't talk to you today, when was the last time you'd ever think about this? Because we get busy in our life. People are busy. They've got things that they're worried about. They've got work that they need to do. And you know as well as I do, even as believers, you know, you need to come to church to remember God. What do you think? An you think an unbeliever's thinking about God? Unbelievers don't think about God. They're doing whatever they do. I mean, it's hard enough to get believers to prioritize God in their life. What makes us think unbelievers think, care about anything to do with spirituality? Unless somebody, like the Bible says, we have compassion on people, making a difference. We pull them out of the fire with fear because we're trying to warn them, hey, you know, you will die one day. You need to think about where you're going to spend eternity. And that might be the one moment in that person's last year or whatever that they've even considered what's going to happen after they die. So, you know, it, lifestyle evangelism doesn't warn people that aren't even thinking about spiritual things because uh, people are too busy with their life. So passive forms of evangelism are, are not biblical. You know, we don't see it in the Bible and there's a lot of problems with them. Now let's go into proactive ways, proactive ways to reach people. One, one way you can broadcast a message, right? So either you do like something like open air preaching where you go and just in a public area and you just broadcast a message, right? And just um, sort of hopefully people will listen to what you have to say. Now there's pros and cons, obviously. Like, you know, there's, there's always, you know, there'll always be people there that will, you know, might listen to you. But some of the cons of open air preaching is, number one, it takes a lot of boldness. So it's not for everybody, right? Because not everybody, I mean, think about, uh, you know, you, you look at stats or whatever and people's number one fear or number two fear is public speaking. So you imagine just getting your average church member to say, yeah, go up, stand on that box and blast a message from a bullhorn. Like, you, you think everybody's going to do that? So it's not something that really everybody can, can take part in because it requires quite a lot of boldness just to be that person that is speaking that message. Um, you know, it requires a loud voice. You know, not everybody is made to... to speak really loudly, have a voice that projects. 
Um, it only works in public places where there are many people present, right? You're not going to open air preach when there's only like two people sitting there because you, you might as well just go and talk, talk to those two people. So you're going to have to go to public places, find those places where people congregate. And that's another problem because it's really noisy as well. So you have to be really loud um, in order to that to be effective. But then you can easily be offensive, right? Because if you are shouting at people, it's harder to, to tell them gently than it is um, when you're just talking to them one-on-one. -on -one. So I'm not saying that there isn't a place. I'm not totally against open-air preaching. I think it, it's good to, to make a public stance and things like that. Um, and I think that's where it can be effective. But in terms of reaching the individuals, it's not that good. Um, what's another way is you can use advertising, right? You can spend a lot of money putting up billboards, putting radio ads, I don't know, radio appearance, TV appearances, you know, making movies or whatnot, where you are basically trying to broadcast this message out there, um, you know, putting posters around. Um, well, what are the problems with that? The problems with that is, number one, they're not interactive. So you kind of have to create a message that caters to the masses to hopefully get their attention. Um, but they're also very cost and talent prohibitive. Right? They cost a lot of money, don't they? You want to put up a billboard. I don't even know how much it costs to put a billboard up. And then how much words can you put on there? How many people are going to pay attention to it? Um, you know, and it's not interactive. It's a good way to advertise, right? To get people to maybe think and ask more questions. But again, if people are not really concerned about that, there's nothing challenging about it. Like if they're just ignoring it, right? As opposed to being able to reach and talk to the individual, um, which is what these messages don't do because you, you can only, if you're spending all this money or you're open-air preaching, you're only going to one location, right? Or you're putting a billboard up in one location. What about the people that don't hear that? Well, they don't see that message. What are you doing to try and reach those people who would, who would not see that message? Um, so it's really good at targeting a mass people, but you'll never catch anybody, everybody. And that's what you know, marketing knows. They're trying to catch as many people as possible, but you're not getting to those individuals that would other, wouldn't otherwise seek you out. So you might broadcast a message. You might invite people to an event. So you might have, like, say, a, a gospel meeting or you might have a movie night. Um, I know some churches put on concerts and musicals. Um, even, like, say, like building a website, uh, or like building an experience where you, know, you create a museum or something like that. But again, these are also cost and talent prohibitive. And um, you still need to get people to that thing. So let's say you create something where a lot of people can come and hear the gospel. But then you're, now you're back to either broadcasting a message or trying to get to the individual. Because you have to somehow get to that person to tell them about that event. And to, to invite them along. And if you're engaging with them already, why not just use that opportunity to talk to them about the gospel? Um, or you have to spend all that money marketing to get them along to this event. And only if they then see that messaging and they're interested, will they even come along to hear the message that you have. So you can broadcast a message. You can invite people along to something, to hear something. But if you're going to do that, you may as well talk to them there. And that's when we get on to point three, which is where you actually approach individuals and you engage and you interact and you discuss with that person one on one the things that they are objecting to. And you can actually cater an approach specifically for them and, and answer their questions and, and convince them why they need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is where door to door soul winning comes into play. This is where one-to-one -one evangelism actually comes into play. So there is the broadcasting, there's inviting people to come and see something. So it's trying to just broadcast a message. You're inviting people to an event or something to come and see. Or you're just going to the people where they are and trying to find them and talk to them. And that's why under this last topic, you know, whether you, whether you say door knocking or whether you say street evangelism, you know, going to a public place and engaging with individuals and talking with them, trying to preach them the gospel, to me, they're pretty much the same thing, right? You know, whether it's going house to house or whether it's going to a public area. But I do think there are pros and cons because if you go to a public area, 
number one is, you know, because when we, when we go door knocking and we run across people, you know, going about their day, you know, we stop them and talk to them as well. So it's, there's, no, there's no real difference. But I'm talking about, like, say, going to a busy area, you know, where people would normally do open air preaching, but then instead of open air preaching, you're just going and talking to people. Some people are more comfortable with that because they don't like necessarily knocking on people's houses. But I think there are some pros and cons, right? There's some pros and cons with going just to public areas or going house to house. One is if you're going to a public area, because it's a public area, people are more self-conscious. I don't know if you've been in a public area before and you've had Christians come along and approach you, maybe when you were an unbeliever or even when you were a Christian. Um, even when you have, like, say, marketers, you know, just giving out things in a public area. What, what happens when that marketer or that Christian approaches one person in a group? What is that one person generally thinking, right? They're thinking, like, why are you talking to me and not everybody else, you know? Or, you know, why, why are they targeted other than anybody else? Because not only what happens is when you target one person in a public area, they are then become self-conscious of what other people are looking at. And they may not be as honest with you because they're self-conscious about what other people think. And that's what happens in public areas. And not only does it happen to the listener, but it happens to the person speaking as well. It requires a bit more boldness for you to approach somebody in a group or in a public area than it does in a private area, doesn't it? So it's a, it's a lot more difficult to do just for the individual believer. Not saying that that makes it bad, but that's one of the downsides, is if you want everybody in church um, uh, getting involved in it, it's a bit harder for them to get to that next step where they're doing something in front of a lot of people as opposed to privately at a door. So it's harder for an, a, a new person to start. I find as well when you're trying to approach people on the street, even sometimes when you're going door to door, and there are people walking up and down and you try and stop them, sometimes it's a bit harder because they're on their way to do something. You know, they're usually out and about because they're going somewhere, they need to go catch a bus, they're going to the shops, they're on their way. So um, you sort of have to stop people from doing something. Generally, they're in this public area because they're out and about doing something. Um, whereas people are at home, generally you, you find it's, it's easier to get somebody that is just at home and, and, and maybe relaxing. Now, what are the advantages of door knocking? Everyone in a certain area lives somewhere, don't they? So you may be going to this public area, but then not everybody that lives in this immediate area or these suburbs are going to those public areas. So how do you reach the people that aren't going to these areas where you frequent every week? But you know within this area, everybody lives somewhere. So there's a systematic way to try and reach everybody that lives in this area because everybody lives somewhere. You know, yes, they may not be home, but at least you can leave something with somebody and there's a systematic way to try and get to each individual. Now, if you're lucky enough to strike up a conversation with somebody at the door, the difference between preaching to somebody in a public area and preaching to somebody at their door is there's an immediate private setting where you can talk to that person and they're in their comfort zone as well because they're at their home. They feel like they would be in more control at their home than you are. You're the person coming to where they are. So I find when you do get into a conversation, it's a lot easier to, to chat in that private setting where the conversation is not being listened to by people sitting next to them at the bus station. It's not being listened to them, you know, next, somebody sitting next to them at the park bench. They can talk and they can open up a bit and be honest with you. And you even see that when you go door to door, when you're talking with somebody, and then somebody else just comes along, immediately it changes the mood of that conversation and they may be a bit more self-conscious because other people are around. So it's a private setting, you know, it's low cost. It doesn't cost anything for us to go door to door, right? We can get everyone involved and think about it. Even sales organizations and political organizations still do door knocking, don't they? To the point where, you know, they have to give people stickers to say don't sell, right? Because they know it's effective in reaching a lot of individuals. That's why they do it. That's why when there are political campaigns and they're trying to reach everybody in an area, right? If it's your local member of parliament, maybe senators don't do it because they can broadcast a message to the nation. But if you're a local MP and you're trying to reach everybody in your neighborhood, you will send people to go and canvas doors. Why? Because they understand that that is an effective and low cost way of reaching everybody in that area. And that's why they do it. 
But not only that, is like I said, you can engage, you can interact, you can discuss, you can actually personalize how you approach that person and they can ask questions. You can go back and forth, which is one thing when you spend all this money trying to broadcast a message, you're just trying to cater it to the masses as opposed to the individuals. So there are other valid ways of preaching the gospel, but in my opinion, door-to-door -door is the most effective because it's, it's in inexpensive, it's achievable for most people, and it's thorough, meaning that we can actually systematically try and reach everybody in this area rather than just hoping the most people are coming to this public area that we're going to. Now, the last thing I just want to talk about, and I'll just breeze through, the, I won't turn to all the scriptures just for sake of time, but we've talked about the importance of the Great Commission, why it's such an emphasis in this church, right? Because it's commanded by God. Um, we talked about why we use the method of door knocking and why I believe it's the most effective for a church to be involved in if we want to reach as many people in our immediate neighbourhood. But what I want you to think about lastly is, you know, What's going to motivate you to go soul winning? Do you know what's going to motivate you to go soul winning? Because a lot of people go soul winning because they are trying to please man, aren't they? They don't want people to, to bug them. You know, that's why I, I talk to a lot of you guys in this room about that, that razor's edge that you have to walk on where you want to encourage people to do the right thing, but at the same time, you don't want them doing it just because you've told them to do it. Right? So, you know, yes, I, 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 I tell you what the Word of God says. I'm mean, trying to encourage you to obey the Word of God, but the conclusion is not you do it just because Victor told you to do it, right? Because that's the wrong reason to, 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 do, to, to keep God's commandments. It's like, you know, out of fear or out of pleasing man. So what should motivate you to go soul winning? Well, if we look at the greatest commandment, greatest commandment in the Bible, where somebody came to Jesus and said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. On, and look at this, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Isn't that an interesting statement that, you know, not only is these two laws encompass all of God's other laws, but I also think it's saying that this is what we should be keeping in mind when we keep God's commandments. Is number one, we ought to do it to love God. That's, that's the first reason why. And the second reason is, is that we ought to love other people. So if we think about what should motivate us to go soul winning, it shouldn't just be because I'm worried about what others will think about me. It's not because like, you know, oh, you know, you know I don't want you know, Victor to get on my case. I want to get, get Victor off my case or get Michael off my case or whatever because they keep bugging me about it. Um, or, you know, whether it's out of, like, say, guilt, you know, you just want to get rid of that feeling. These are wrong reasons for why you should go soul winning. What are the right reasons? The right reasons are love. You know, number one, a love for God. Because, and I won't go to all these verses, but I, I, just, want to, I just want to go through these reasons because we're running out of time. But, you know, because God wants people to be saved. Right? That's something that God wants. And if we love God, wouldn't we desire what God wants us to do, like what he wants from us? You know, you think about the people that you love in your life, the people that are close to you, and you would do anything for them, right? You know, whether it's a best friend, whether it's your mom and dad, whether it's a sibling, and you think, if that person called me and they asked me to do something, they needed me to do something, there are people in your life where at the drop of a hat you would go and do it, right? Because you love them. And why do you love them? You know, maybe it's because you have a past with them where they have done things for you. You appreciate them in your life. You appreciate the value that they bring to your life. And that's why you, you will do anything for them. That's how God wants us to serve him. You know, and the reason why we don't serve him the way we ought is because we do not reflect on what God has done for us. We don't reflect on how good God has been to us um, how much he has provided us with, what he does for us, that that love, that, that the fact that God loved us, you know, we love him because he first loved us. So our love is in response to his love. And the reason why you don't love God enough is because you haven't reflected on what God has done for you. Because if you took a moment to think about what God does for you, the fact that he gives you life, 
the ability, you know, your family, everything that you cherish and hold dear came from God. Do you realize that? And, and that's going to be the sad thing if you don't use your life to serve God. You're going to get to the judgment seat because once we shed this flesh, our, uh, the scales will come off our eyes, right? And, and it will be no mystery to us what God has done for us. And, and when we think about what we have done for God, we will be so ashamed that we didn't do more, you know? And we need to be reminded while we're on this earth, you know, we need to be reminded what God has done for us so that we do not waste our life, waste our time. Um, you know, we love, we love what God has given us, like our family and our friends, more than we love the God that gave them to us. You know, because God has commands for us. You know, God wants us to be in church. He wants us to read the Bible and pray for one another, preach the gospel to every creature. But think about in your life, are these the things that get cut off first? You know, because generally uh, believers that don't love God the things of God are the things that go first when other things come up. You know, you've got family things go up, so then you don't go to church. You've got things to do on the weekend, so you don't go soul winning. You've got other things to do, so you don't have time for your brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, it's, 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 isn't it funny that what we ought to love the most is what gets put last sometimes on our totem pole? And, and that, that should bring us some shame. That, that should make us feel bad, you know, that God who does so much for us and, you know, what do we do for him? Do we even think about what he wants? He wants people saved. The last thing he said to us was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And that's the last thing we spend our time on. And this is why it's so important. And this is why we want to make sure this church never gets to that point. And this will always be a soul winning church because this church wants to bring God glory. This church loves God. And this is what God wants. God wants people to be saved. He will that all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So, you know, let's not love the things that God loves, the things that, let's not love the things that God gave us more than the things that, uh, more than God, the God that gave it to us. So number one, that should motivate you to go soul winning, a love for God. And if that motivation is there, you'll love the other things too. You know, you'll have a love for your church. Where you'll be, in, uh, you'll be a good example, not just your church, but your family. You think about it, if you go soul winning and you're involved in the work of God, not only are you loving God, but you'll be a loving example to not only your family, but also your church. Because how high, how high a priority is your family going to make the things of God if you do not have God as a high priority on your list? So you'll be an example. You know, you'll teach others, right? Because you go soul winning, you'll take them with you. That's what I like about, you know, daughter or soul winning is that you know you go there you take somebody with you you know it's a bit of like a live q a there and they learn things right they learn um the different answers to different things and it's uh you know not only that but you you get to know people better so you get to know your church better not only that if you go soul winning you'll encourage the other soul winners you know even if you're not a talker even if you go along as a silent partner the more people that are going soul winning it'll encourage others to go soul winning too um, and because you're on board with one of the main works in our church, you're going to have better fellowship with each other, right? You're going to have better, there's, there's going to be better friendships in the church. And you know what the advantage of that is? Is that you're then able to admonish one another, right? Because if you have better relationships with people in the church, you have friends in church, you establish good relationships in church, then not only can you admonish somebody else who is, is doing something wrong, but they can admonish you. There's some accountability there. You don't just get away week after week after week with not uh, doing the right thing. And I see that from my point of view as the bishop of this church because when somebody's not doing the right thing, well, they come to me, right? And they want me to go deal with it. And sometimes I think, well, if you had a good relationship with that person, you could deal with it. You could bring it up with them. See, the reason why people see somebody doing something wrong and they want to come to me is because they don't have the relationship with that person to go directly to them. Because if they had a good relationship with them, they, I wouldn't need to be involved. You know, they would just talk, they would, they would admonish one another and sharpen one another as a man sharpens, sharpens his friend. So love for God, number one. Love for your church and your family, like the example you set. But love for the unbeliever as well. Remember, you know, why are we preaching the gospel to the unbelievers? Because hell is real. Hell is a real place. 
Uh, you know, maybe that's one another reason why you don't get involved in the soul winning. It's not a high priority for you because you don't realize, you haven't reflected on the fact that people are going to die and go to hell and we need to get out there and be involved in the work so that these people do not go to hell. And, you know, there's a chance for us to convince them that they need to believe on Jesus Christ. And lastly, you know, it's, and I put this last because there's a bonus for yourself, obviously, when you keep the Great Commission. There are rewards to be earned. You know, there are people that you have personally won to the Lord. Um, and also, as you go out and preach the gospel, you learn more when you teach. You know, that's why, that's why, you know, you might go to church. You've been going to this church for two years, but if you're not learning a lot, it's because you're not out there preaching the gospel, first of all, and teaching others. But maybe you're not as involved in teaching other people within the church as well and helping them to understand the Bible more. Because the more you teach, the more you will learn. Not only that, when I go out soul winning, I'm reminded of how much God loves me. You know, there are times when, you know, I forget. You know, I'm not thinking about how much God loves me, but when I go out and preach the gospel and I talk about the love of God and the grace of God, it reminds me, it reminds my partner as well, you know, how much God loves us. And I don't forget as much because I'm constantly teaching it every week that I don't go months and months without on end not thinking about this because every week we're reminded because we're trying to teach others that. What are some other advantages? I'm just, just going through some quickly here, but... Another one is, for a brief moment when I go soul winning, I'm not focused on me and my problems. I'm focused on the problems of others. You know, and, and all of us go through challenges in our life, whether it's health challenges, financial challenges, relationship challenges, and life can get hard, right? Life can get you down. But soul winning, sometimes there's a moment in time where you're not just looking at yourself. Because sometimes even though life is hard, we get very selfish and self-centered, where we just are just thinking about how hard we have it, thinking about how bad we have it. But when you go soul winning, there's a moment in time where you're not thinking about yourself because you're trying to be a bit selfless and now you're thinking about the person that you're talking to and hoping that they will get saved because they have a bigger problem than we do. I'm always learning new things, new methods, better ways of explaining things. And, you know, you know I know God is pleased that I'm trying to be fruitful and win souls. That's another good thing, just to know that I'm pleasing my Father in heaven. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's our duty, isn't it? So even if we don't take the time, we don't have this desire to go soul winning, God commands us to go soul winning. Um, look at what it says here in 1 Corinthians 9, verse 16. Look at what Paul says. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. See, so it's not, it's not, it's not that I'm up here showing off to you that look at how much soul winning I do. It's like, it's like saying, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. It's not like I'm doing something special or something. Why? For necessity is laid upon me. See, it's, it's, it's necessary. God commands me to go soul winning. Do I glory in keeping God's commandments? You know, it makes me, it's, I'm just doing what I'm told to do. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. See, there's the problem is that if we don't keep God's commandments, there's a problem there. Why? Because it's a necessity that's laid upon us. For if I do this willingly, I have a reward. So it's saying if you have the right frame of mind and you do this with the right motivation, you'll be rewarded. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. So he's saying, even if you don't want to do it, you've got to do it anyway. <laughs> right? So if you do it, if you do it for the right reasons, you'll, you'll get a reward. If you're not doing it for the right reasons and you're not doing it, you've got to do it anyway. Right? Because it's, um, we're commanded to do it. The necessity is laid upon us. So love ought to be what motivates us to go soul winning. You know, love for God. You know, and, that, and then it'll flow on that we'll have love for our church and our family love for the unbelievers, you know, and even loving yourself, you know, don't you love yourself enough to go soul winning? And think about this, love is something that you decide to do even if you don't feel like doing it, right? Love is not just this emotion that you have. Love is, if you read in 1 Corinthians 13, it's a decision, it's an action, it's something that you do even when you don't feel like doing, to, doing it. So, you need to grow in your Christian life. You need to grow in your Christian walk where you get to the point where you do things even if you don't feel like doing it. And that's why you don't wake up Sunday morning or you don't wake up Saturday morning and decide then whether you're going to go soul winning. Because if you do that, you're not going to feel like going soul winning. Even, the, even, even those of us that go soul winning, 
We don't always feel like going soul winning. But you grow to the point where you realize it's the right thing to do. It's commanded by God. You know, I, I need to be a good example. And I do it because it's right. And I love God and I love my church. Not necessarily because I feel like doing it. And there will be days where you feel like doing it. And there will be days you don't. But if your motivation is love, you'll do it whether you feel like doing it or not. Anyways, I hope that uh, was a good reminder for you. It was a, the sermon was a blessing. It gives you a bit of insight into why daughter to soul winning, you know, and why it's such an emphasis at our church. Uh, but let's pray and then we'll sing one more song. All right, thank you, Lord, for your word. Um, thank you for the reminder. And um, just pray, Lord, that we would uh, grow in our efforts to, to preach the gospel to every creature. That, Lord, we would be a church that is not only pleasing to you, but we are a church that brings you the most glory, the glory that you deserve. May the, may the lamb that was slain uh, receive the reward of his suffering. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would help us to have a right spirit, right walk with you. That, Lord, you would open our eyes to the things that you've done for us so that, um, that love would constrain us to serve you and to want to prioritize you in our life, to, be able to, to, to make us set more time aside uh, as we grow in our spiritual life, to serve you, to serve this church, and to serve this community. Pray, Lord, that um, you'd help us to grow. And um, we love you, Lord. Love you for what you've done for us. And um, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.